Uh, welcome to Cal uh, from home. Uh, we're going to be having a talk tonight with Tom Milo. I'm William Anderson. I'm currently the chair of the Art and Graphic Design Program at the American University of Kuwait. And I'm part of a team um, of TypeCal that was, uh, I think, an important organization that started to have seminars. And it's the first seminar in Kuwait that focuses on typography and calligraphy. And the two co-founders are here with us, Mariam Hussainia and Lubna Saif Abbas. Uh, and they are help put this all together along with the team, myself, and Fumana, and Hussein, and Fatima, that I think some of them are with us uh, tonight. A couple of things to keep in mind uh, tonight is that it's probably better if you can mute, uh, so we don't have a lot of sounds going on, background sounds. Um, it does help even with the speed if you can turn off your video. Uh, um, we'll have... Tom will be giving his presentation. He'll be introduced by Lubna, uh, but then we're gonna have some, hopefully have some time for questions and answers a little bit later. You can chat, you can uh, put those into the chat. If you're just joining us now, you can just put in the chat where you're uh, joining us from. Uh, after, we're gonna also be sending out a survey. Uh, so if you can uh, fill that out, as well as on August 31st, uh, we're going to be having our next guest le lecture, uh, Mohammed uh, Jabber. Um, I also just want to mention that we're getting sponsorship from Yadawi and the American University of Kuwait. And if you didn't hear before, uh, this is being recorded, uh, and then it will be sent a link uh, to you. It was really great that I was able to be part of the last uh, symposium, TypeCal Symposium in Kuwait and got to meet uh, Tom. He's a really unique, interesting character. But I'll let uh, Lubna, one of the co-founders of TypeCal, introduce him formally. Thank you. Uh, welcome and good evening from Kuwait. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm going to just uh, try to keep my introduction um, short and sweet because I think that uh, Thomas is going to be sharing um, a plethora of information and I'm so excited about hearing um, all about um, his experiences. So from 1980 to 1983, uh, Thomas Milo was in Lebanon as a captain in the Royal Netherlands Army. He was working closely with the community and he wanted to impart the importance in a typographic and in linguistic format of appreciating Lebanese culture and how the military staff um, should better conduct themselves. And he designed an operational and conversational guide. And this guide included recipes as well that he and his wife, Maria, still serve today. This resonated um, with Thomas um, as we decided on the theme both uh, Thomas, uh, Mariam, and I, one day before the catastrophic explosion this past August the 4th in Beirut. As a student, he drove uh, Mercedes 190B limousines from Amsterdam uh, to Beirut uh, between 1973 and 1976. In the Royal Netherlands Army from 1980 to 1983, he served two operational tours as captain of special duties and was the Arabic speaking officer in the intelligence and operations section of Dutchbat Unifil based in Haris, South Lebanon. Thomas Milo is a linguist uh, and a digital humanities pioneer as well as a developer of, among others, Decotype Arabic typesetting technology and the typesetting technology used by Royal Grill Publishers and New York University Press, Growing Library of Arabic Literature, which is an ambitious project to document Arabic literary culture on the same academic level as the famous Loeb editions of the Latin and Greek classics. The Dr. Peter Caro award-winning Decotype smart font technology has been the model for OpenType. He's also, uh, as uh, William had mentioned earlier, he was one of our debut speakers at the TypeCal Symposium in 2019. Join me in welcoming Thomas Milo this evening. Okay. Um, uh, I, I come from, uh, uh, I thought it's interesting to 
to give some background to make it more plausible that I did all these absurd things. But I, I, I come from, from a kind of education that basically wants to breed the, uh, the backbone of, of, of uh, the average European uh, uh, civilization. But let me start with, uh, with this. Uh, what you see here is, uh, is a suggestion that I, I, I recently saw on Facebook. Someone made tuna falafel. I followed the recipe. So here's the tuna on the left, best Span Spanish tuna and olive oil. And here you have our own best Galician home cooked uh, 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 hummus, uh, uh, chickpeas. Then of course, uh, parsley and fresh parsley and fresh uh, 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 coriander. That was also part of the deal and some other st stuff that I won't discuss. But anyway, I took it through my sausage mice machine, my meat grinder which is my, norm, my most used kitchen uh, uh, tool. <laughs> and <clears throat> then during the frying, something happened and actually the automatic picture analysis uh, uh, identifies this as black coffee. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a completely failed uh, tuna, uh, uh, tuna falafel. They dissolved in the oil. Anyway, we froze the remainder, and we were now we are now working on a strategy how to how to put it to good use. But anyway, why would I why would I have this image? Because um, first, I come from, as I as I started to say, I come from a, a background where where, where uh, the education was as broad as possible, not just uh, the, the physics, mathematics, chemistry. Uh, 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 we also had the French, German, English, uh, and uh, uh, and the, the the focus was really on Latin and Greek. We, we had two hours Greek and two hours Latin every day for six, seven years, five, six years. Which which which, by the way, is then starting when you're twelve years old. So here you have a book in Latin. This is my original school book: uh, How Caesar Conquers What's Now France. And we actually had to read this in Latin. And, and the first chapter, the first line, everybody knows it. It actually describes the country where I'm living. So, Gallia est omnis divisa in partes tres. Gaul is, as a whole, divided in three parts. Quarum unam incolum belgae, of which one the Belgians inhabited it, inhabit it. And the Belgians are roughly the same tribe as where I belong now. And then it continues. So, so we do this as twelve-year-olds, and and then um, um, actually it describes the, the the incredibly crude and 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 merciless methods that the Romans applied to teach these people uh, civilization. There's actually, by the way, let me back up. There's a very, very condescending uh, thing about the Belgians. It it says here, "Horum omnium of all those fortissimi sunt Belgae, the most." The, the strongest are the Belgians. Propteria, because, quot a cultu atque humanitate provincia longissime absunt, because they are the most, most distant away from civilization and humanity in the province. Mini meque at eus mercatore sepe comeant atque. And they also have the least frequent contacts with traders. Uh, quae at effeminandos animos pertinent, who tend to lead to the effemination of the character of people. So the more trade, the more feminine you become. And therefore the, they become, they're very hard and rude fighters. But it's a way, uh, but and also in order to deal with these people, they have very hard and rude methods. And it's all written in the first person. So Caesar writes, I went there, I did that, I did that. And in recent times, and that was only two decades before when I went to school, we had another man who was conquering Europe. He wrote a book, Mein Kampf which is kifahi in Arabic, it's my struggle. So it occurred to me that this man is actually writing Mein Kampf in Latin. And so I gave it to all my classmates in 1963, and they all put their censorship stamp on it. That had various reasons not to allow a book like this to be uh, read by the public. But anyway, it also shows that I was really a 13-year-old when I did that. 
but it builds also a kind of curiosity and interest and from there I got interested in Russian and in Old Bulgarian because that was nearest in style and structure to Greek and um, I also when I started to study it I discovered that one of the latest technologies was actually made available to deal with this obscure and commercially not viable script the Old Bulgarian Cyrillic <coughs> This is a type head from the IBM Selectric typewriter. I still have it in my collection. But I also traveled and I discovered the, the joy of speaking a language. And here you have a newspaper from what was then the southern part of Yugoslavia, the, sta the, the province of Macedonia. And here in Macedonian, Vohrit, in the town of Orit, it's, it has a, a headline saying, these people forsake their language because of ours. Poradi Makedonski od Gizaboraviv, Drugite Yazici. Because of Macedonian, they forgot all the other languages. And look, lo and behold, here is me in the newspaper with my own uh, signature, Tom Milo. And so that dragged me in. That uh, a Russian also drew my attention to uh, to Turkish because there's a lot of 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 of, of publications in Turkish about Central Asian Turks and at the same time Western Europe including the Netherlands and we're still in the 1970s started to fill up with guest workers and these guest workers were basically treated like uh, people from the colonies and here is for instance a meeting by the Dutch trade unions where they were deciding the policies regarding the new foreign workers and there was already with the help of a group of students a trade union organized by the Turks themselves and they were not invited but it was about them so here is the leader of the Turkish trade union who has a statement he doesn't know Dutch yet so he asks me to read his statement we, we just broke into this this convention and they're a bit embarrassed as you can see but anyway that was another thing but Turkish uh, was such a mind-blowing new perspective that I decided to change from Slavic to Turkic languages and in in the pers in the perspective of the academic world Turkish was part of Islamic civilization no study of Turkish without knowing Arabic so that made it necessary for me to learn Arabic and in the <coughs> Arabic department they had a policy there is no studying of Arabic without knowing how to write it properly so I had to learn to write Arabic like an Arab. Um, so, and actually there was a, a magnificent manual for it, which had it all lined up in a format that I would be able to understand, mathematical like chessboard format. In the vertical column you see the initial forms, in the horizontal column you see the final forms, and in the, on the chessboard you see the chemistry that occurs when these initial and final positions merge. And of course, this is number one of the table. The table continues to sh insert all the letters in the groups of three to show you how Arabic works. And in my mind, this is a script grammar. But I was so fascinated by this totally unexpected dimension of studying Arabic that I became better at it than I had bargained for. And the Moroccan workers liked my handwriting to the point that I, they wanted me to be there calligrapher of posters. So here is a call for a hunger strike, Idrab uh, Anata'am, written by me in the Roka style. Uh, uh, anyone who knows the Roka style can see that it's not really very good, but it was the best you could get in the Netherlands in those days. And later I improved a bit. This is a pamphlet that I wrote um, in, in, with a calligraphic pen in the Roka style in the mid 70s for Moroccans. But I did also a lot of traveling. It was easy to hitchhike. I just took a tram to the city edge, uh, 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 stuck up my thumb at the motorway entrance, and within 20 minutes I would be on my way to the south, south of Germany, hop off the car and get another one that took me to mid-Yugoslavia, and with another one I would be in Turkey for, for peanuts. But I thought, this is not good enough, I would like to work in Turkey. If the Turks can come to work here, I would like to work there. So I got my driver's license and I thought, if I am a, a truck driver there, 
I can completely blend into the population. And why did I want to do that? Because in those days, many people hitchhiked, traveled for peanuts, all the way to Afghanistan and, and India for the drugs. And I was identified by the local population as just one of them. And they were, there was an incredible disdain for these European youths that were traveling for nothing, in spite of the fact that they, they were ostensibly a lot richer than everybody else, and then went to a world that they didn't understand to smoke drugs to understand even less. And I thought it's better not to be associated with them, and that's why I wanted to become a truck driver rather than a, hitch than a hitchhiker. But anyway, this is an interesting cross-fertilization. In order to become a good truck driver, I also took my way through the theory of what trucks are and how they're constructed and how to maintain them. But on top of that, you see an image of a book in Russian that dis compares the structures of Turkish languages through the ages. It is a comparative historical grammar of Turkic languages. In Russian, Sravnitona Istorichskaya Grammatika Turkskih Yezikov. And this is the. So here I am on, on the tracks between Europe and Central Asia and, far, and, and Southeast Asia. And what I discover is something that I hadn't been able to, to, to suspect another mind blowing uh, uh, new perspective that there, was a tr there were trucking companies trying to pioneer a road between Western Europe and Pakistan overland. The unknown 20th century overland quest to India. And uh, <laughs> first, as when I studied, started to study Turkish, the magnitude of my world started to grow. This is a map that I photographed. It, uh, I, this is actually the map that was created for the um, um, uh, Academy of the Arts in London when they had a, an, an exhibition called Turks. And Turks are, is usually used in a condescending way, but this, this what they did is civilization from the 6th to the 16th century, and it spread over Eurasia. And how, here you see in all these colored uh, areas how the Turks moved from east to west. It's like a spotlight on the wall, it moves from right to left. And relative to this magnitude, the world that I was educated with is, becomes a post stamp. Here you see a page from uh, 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 one of our school books, uh, a, a map of the Roman Empire, and this is at, at its largest. But this was the area. <laughs> so world civilization was focused on the Romans and the Greeks. Two post stamps on the size of Eurasia, and we learned those languages thoroughly, and then be, be, before that everything stopped. It's a bit like Jahiliya in Islam. You have a starting point, but before that you're not even interested. So we were, not in, we were not educated in what the Persians did. We only learned about the Persian attacks on the Greeks. And the, books, the book that describes them has only two Persian words in them. And that triggered my interest in what's beyond. But anyway, as, as a hitchhiker, and later a, a, a driver of cars to the Middle East, and eventually a truck driver, I discovered that the, the, the road on the map, the modern map, in the 1970s was always E for echo number five, the European road number five, from England all the way to Syria and Lebanon. And then I, and once I became, I, 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 I was in, in, um, in Turkey, it dawned on me that this is actually a very old road that the Romans had already in use. The Roman army built, built <laughs> and reinforced these roads and a reinforced road is a via strata via is a route and strata means it has been stabilized with stones on top and of course it's the origin for the for the english word street for the dutch word strat and for the arabic word surat like in ehdina surat al mustaqim it's a, a a roman latin word uh, by the way, uh, what moves over these roads are exercitus, their armies, and what is an army in Arabic? Askar. It's also from Roman, Latin, military structure. 
and and they moved between fortified positions and they were, they were these were called kastrum or kastra in plural and that is qasar qasar in arabic so you have the three instruments of empire that the romans used to stabilize a huge area with a small, relatively small number of troops, they they dispersed a, a number of arm of fortified positions. They connected them with with stabilized roads, and they had mobile armies. And this is the normal army is armia, um, and, but this is exercitus, and those are what the ones the fast moving ones. But anyway, this bridge is a bridge in in Turkey. And obviously, it, it is a bridge from the from the Ottoman days, but in the Ottoman shape, it is identical to what it was in the Byzantine period, which is also known as the Eastern Roman Empire, and it is identical to the bridge that you would have in the Roman Empire. So the whole road, actually, from the Hadrian Wall in Scotland through a place called Edirne today, but originally. Hadrian's town, Adrianopolis, is part of the same road system and it still was that in the 1970s. And on these roads, pioneers emerged. A small English company, Asia Transport, drove all the way from England to Iran with, with uh, uh, articulated trucks. Now, where the British go, and this is an old European tradition, where the Brits go, the Dutch go. But, of course, the Dutch are cheap, so they don't have an articulated truck. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> they don't even have a sleeper cabin. <coughs> but I can assure you, <coughs> they were driving with two, two men on this truck because the other guy took the picture. And, indeed, they make it to Tehran. So here says, Sheriket Iran i Trak, the Iranian trucking company. <laughs> so then when I'm hitchhiking, I get a, a ride from this with this monster truck. It's a Mack truck, bigger than the average European truck, much more powerful, and 16 gears. The guy who <laughs> invites me to sit next to him all the way back from Turkey to Holland is my age and he was returning from a round trip to Pakistan as you can see it's written all over the truck and during our conversations the idea emerged that what he can do I can do too because it in what I saw was this <laughs> this is from an historical map of the world in the 17th century and it shows in colors how the European nations and particularly the, the first the, the Spanish and the Portuguese, and then, in, uh, then directly behind them, <laughs> the, the English and, and the Dutch. And the English and the Dutch have a kind of a, a permanent competition on these routes to India. And then when I saw that there were British trucks going to India and the Dutch trucks, I thought now I'm seeing in my day and age something that I only learned about as, a hist as an historical event. So I got my driver's license, became a truck driver myself, went through all the stages of increased uh, uh, weight of these trucks and joined, applied to the company whose yellow truck you just saw. And these are basically farm people from the south of the Netherlands that uh, turned, chain, turned to another industry. And when I walked in, when I spoke to them, they wanted me. Because I spoke by that time, I, at least I knew about, about every language between the Netherlands and the Persian Gulf. But when I walked in, they said, you ain't no trucker, son. <laughs> you ain't no truck driver. So I was very quickly on my way out. They didn't really saw a career for me in that industry. But as I walked out, a door opened, a Turk opened recognizes me and starts a complete conversation in Turkish with me. So they call me back, hey you come back, you're hired. So why would this Turk know me and why would he call, speak with me? Because there is only one way to go from the Netherlands to Iran or from the Netherlands to uh, the, the Arab uh, Gulf. And every truck of this company moved to one particular town on the edge of the uh, Tarsus Mountains in, uh, in southern Turkey, 
many of the boys of that town had dialed the same telephone number that I had dialed and they were hired as truck drivers because Turks were cheaper than Dutch. The same formula, I couldn't get into Turkey but they could get into Holland. So in any way, to cut a long story short, I become, I get the contract and I become member of my of the club, my heroes. I couldn't imagine <laughs> that as a cross-eyed student of Latin and Greek and Bulga old Bulgarian that I would <laughs> end up driving these trucks. They placed me, they, they gave me a position in uh, Damam uh, on, uh, on the Persian Gulf, but you can see that the, 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 their main operation was Pakistan because of a, an, a, an international Dutch electronics company called uh, Philips International. Uh, they had goods that had to be moved fast and uh, the normal route through the Suez Canal was getting blocked all the time because, because of the frequent wars between Israel and the Arabs. So for some goods it was actually worth <laughs> the effort to load them on a truck and to pay the extra cost. And what they also discovered that if you enter Pakistan from the harbor, your container may end up months before it's really uh, 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 <laughs> cleared for, in, for, in, for import. If you, enter, <coughs> if you enter Pakistan from the rear door, you're the only truck. And within 45 minutes you can continue. So they had an incredible increase of speed. So it really was worth the deal. But when Saudi Arabia started to, to order things, Saudi Arabia was discovered and the Arab countries discovered the oil weapon in 1973. <coughs> countries like the United States, but also many countries like the Netherlands, <coughs> enthusiastically supported Israel and the Arab nations reacted by cutting, closing the oil supply. And all of a sudden they discovered that um, after the war was over that there was no need to open it again for the same price. So all of a sudden there was an incredible price hike in oil due to this 1973 Yom Kippur war which led to such an incredible jump in wealth in the Arab states that everybody started to buy like mad uh, from Europe which led to a congestion first in all the harbors because they had no infrastructure to offload all these containers with goods then they had them flown in which led to a congestion of all the airports and finally this company said we can do door-to-door -door delivery for very well-paying expensive top industries like Philips but we can also do it to private citizens so Saudi uh, uh, private goods were picked up in Germany and the, delivered all the way door to door into Saudi Arabia and for the last bit they needed me to, to help them navigate through the desert and get at their destination because Turks don't know Arabic and for me it was an extraordinary opportunity to move between Turkish and Arabic on a daily basis and to drive these trucks I could take turns on these long drives in Saudi Arabia and, and I actually <coughs> did also <coughs> reconnaissance work there was um, a talk of a new road from, from Mecca uh, all the way down to, <coughs> to Khamis Mushait on the uh, Yemeni border uh, that, uh, and then I had to verify it and I, I came back with the message the road is not ready as you can see and it, which produced some nice photographs but anyway a totally different um, it's in, uh, a narrative in my story is this in the 1970s there was, there was a cold war going on and there was a permanent threat of nuclear annihilation between from the from both sides between the East Bloc and the Western Bloc and the Netherlands was very close to the front the Netherlands is here marked on the map and in order to stop such attacks the Netherlands had very well equipped and aggressive units uh, to fight a bloody battle with the Russians the Polish and the East Germans
And in these units, they always had Russian intelligence speaker, intelligence officers, Russian-speaking intelligence officers, officers <laughs> to be able to follow radio communications of the enemy and uh, in order to interrogate uh, uh, p uh, p prisoners of war. But in, in again another another narrative, there is this permanent conflict between Israel and the surrounding states in which Israel invades Lebanon in 78. It leads to the installing of a international peacekeeping force which collapses. And why does it collapse? First, the Cold War on the map made it possible to travel safely from Amsterdam all the way to Pakistan because there were basically only two blocks. It's, it's, it's hard to realize, but we have now a fragmented world in terms of security and stability. <laughs> but the, the trade-off of this, the positive trade-off of the Cold War was that <coughs> the NATO countries, you had <coughs> all the way to Greece, <coughs> Bulgaria was the only enemy country, Yugoslavia was neutral, Turkey was part of NATO, Iraq and Iran were part of CENTO, the Central Treaty Organization, and Pakistan was also part of the Central Treaty Organization or of, of CATO, Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. Basically, the Americans had surrounded the Soviet Union with, with allied nations. And through these countries, it was easy to hitchhike or to drive trucks. Until in 79, <laughs> the Iranian Revolution takes place. It breaks the continuous route. And uh, next year, the Russians invade Afghanistan, <coughs> which was the other <coughs> neutral portion on the route. So basically, from that moment, the co collapse of the safety over this long distance route starts. <laughs> but the re revolution in Iran had another interesting effect because Iran had actually contributed to the United Nations peacekeeping force in Lebanon. The Iranian Imperial Army, here it is, Iranian Imperial Army is present with its 184 infantry battalion in South Lebanon. And here is an ex extraordinary picture of a series of Russian Soviet made army trucks operated by the Iranian army on a location that was later taken over by the Dutch and here you see side by side the Iranian ZIL-131 where ZIL stands for Zavod Imini Lukhachova the factory named after a certain Lukhachov <laughs> and the Dutch DAF Van Dornes Automobilfabriek YA328 trucks here side by side NATO and uh, Warsaw Pact style truck side by side which was, is an extraordinary image for these days. Anyway the Iranians are on their way out and the Dutch are on their way in. Another issue was that the Israelis had claimed that they had um, cleared the whole area from their border up to the first river where the UN was going to operate. But in practice the, this was not true. They had failed to clear it and the French who tried to clear it got into serious problems with the Palestinians. Their battalion commander was seriously injured, lost one eye, as you can see in this later photo taken later. And here is a description of that deadly gun battle <laughs> where uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jean Salvant uh, was badly wounded by machine gun fire. The French pulled out, so French crack troops pulled out. At this moment in time, no nation in the world was willing to provide troops for Lebanon because if you withdraw these troops then there, it's, there, sh there should be something silly going on. But anyway, the Dutch had been begging to, to be allowed to join, to rejoin the United Nations after their disaster in Indonesia. We fought the Indonesians for five years. We're not welcome in any Muslim country. But on this, under these conditions, the Dutch were asked to join, and here they are in the battle zone where these, th these, these battalion areas, the Senegalese battalion, the Fijian, Fijian battalion, the Irish, the Nigerian, 
and in the north, the Nepalese and the Norwegians. Between these, where these were supposedly taking over a cleared area, but this triangle uh, actually indicates a position where there were uh, that was full with uh, Palestinian guerrilla positions that could not be taken over. It was known as the Iron Triangle. <laughs> <laughs> the Israelis had not even dared to get into the area that we know as Tire Pocket and when they pulled out they realized that they would not leave behind a cleared area and it, they set up local militias in blue to add another illegal element into the demilitarized zone. So in fact the UN was moving into a demilitarized <laughs> zone <laughs> that was not demilitarized but had fighters on both sides deeply inserted in the areas that we were patrolling. In this concept where a NATO force, a NATO country was asked to send troops, the Dutch government decided to send a fully armed Cold War grade unit instead of just troops and that included Russian speaking officers. But you know what? Nobody speaks Russian in Lebanon so they changed the Russian speaking officers into Arabic speaking officers. And that's how I, <laughs> how I became part of this operation. So I volunteered. Most of them were conscripts with a, vol with a professional cater of officers. This is a joke that they put up in the uh, 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 headquarters one day. But I was uh, trained and commissioned into the army as an officer and from there I was thrown into the snake pit, did all kinds of operational things, but the main focus, <coughs> my main focus was to be on the spot whenever Dutch troops interfered with attacks on Israel or Israeli attacks on the Palestinians. But the Palestinians were the ones who were the most active and here is for instance a small clip from the monthly report uh, 1980 a Dutch battalion apprehended eight armed elements and it continues they are believed to be from a Palestinian rejectionist faction they must be because the Palestinians uh, agreed to the presence of the UN so these must be rejectionists uh, they were they were uh, armed with anti-tank rockets uh, and uh, hand grenades and that sort of stuff but here is the the interesting thing Attempts of Dutch troops to apprehend the infiltrators were hampered by heavy firing from Israeli defense forces and what we called de facto forces, troops that were not supposed to be there, but that the Israelis had set up in their place. So we were basically being mortared and machine gunned from one side while we were trying to disarm suicide squads from the other side. And my job was to go forward and eyeball with them and make jokes. So this, I describe this also as joke warfare because it was the only thing you could do. When I got back from that, uh, the Dutch army appreciated the fact that I uh, knew a bit more than just soldiering and they also had uh, understanding that I had a very, very hard tour of duty. So they asked me to work on a description of the local language. And since I was an, 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 a, also a liaison officer with the uh, Lebanese official army, uh, here you see one of their jeeps, Al uh, Irtibat, uh, uh, as you can see here, and this is Al Jaysh al Lubnani, and here Al Quwat al Dawaliya, which is not technically not a correct term. We were called actually Quwat al Tawari, Al Muwa'ata fi Janoub Lubnan. But in any case, uh, <coughs> here you see in white the result of. What I saw, there was no technology that could handle the script as I saw it, and eventually we succeeded in doing it ourselves decades later. So I produced a manual and I focused on the things that are really relevant. Uh, <coughs> the letters are relevant because we, ma our soldiers manned roadblocks uh, with cars, with, with uh, uh, number plates, and the people who were showing uh, Hawiya identification cards. And so they had to recognize personal names. Then they had to m be able to handle the map. And they had to be able to do minimal, minimal uh, uh, niceties when running into local population. And they had, in my mind, if you shake hands with Lebanese, the next thing that happens is you're invited for dinner. So if you realize that many of the troops 
were from uh, the countryside in the Netherlands with 18 years old, no background or experience in foreign countries, often arrived in Lebanon with their very first airplane flight and their very first trip in a foreign country from a country that doesn't have <coughs> a cul culinary civilization like, like the Middle East, these people would be suspicious of everyth anything that was not a potato and a, a bare bones piece of meat. <laughs> so I included descriptions of what they were likely to get and I explained to them that for an Arab this is what the map looks like and nothing else. I gave them, for the smarter ones, a, a schematical description of how Arabic verbs and nouns work and actually basic dialogues like let me give you one dialogue if uh, the, the bottom one it, there <laughs> our soldiers had to stop set up roadblocks sometimes at places where the population did not expect them it would annoy the population so it would, <laughs> it would be nice to be able to say fi anasin al there are snipers further on in the village so this is why we stop you and for the dutch to understand how it's constructed i give fi and then fi anas which is there is a sniper fi anasin there are snipers fi anasin abdaya there are snipers in the little village and fi anasin fi anasin ab al abdaya there are snipers in the heart of the little village this is just an example <clears throat> but what i was never really satisfied about is <coughs> in spite of the fact <coughs> that i had a good co good budget to produce this that no industry, no company could provide the Arabic that I had seen in the Middle East. But to, to stick on another thing, what do you eat? Well, here is a description of hummus with tahini. You see the Arabic letters here and, and my transliteration for Dutch soldiers and what it is. So hummus with tahini is a paste of chickpeas and sesame butter or sesame paste then tum which is of course garlic and then you have hamad which is um, uh, 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 lemon ba'adunis parsley uh, ba'adunis you see i write a little q here for ba'adunis and filful for the pepper <laughs> so actually i was describing this and indeed to this i think that what i did what i published in 1981 with a print run of 11,000 copies was the first and the biggest book ever done in the Netherlands that mentions hummus, uh, uh, falafel, mlochie, uh, and a whole lot of other Lebanese dishes. And this is how I went about doing it, using again my meat grinder, but this time I'm doing it with, not with boiled chickpeas, but of course with raw chickpeas, because that was the, the flaw in the recipe that I got, and that turned my, uh, my uh, <coughs> tuna falafel into uh, black coffee but anyway here here we go and this is how we cross fertilize between civilization here you see a, a, a decent Dutch dish with a decent Lebanese one and actually we sometimes have garden parties and here I contributed to a larger number of dishes a bigger version now another one is this here you see me inspecting falafel in the village of Tibnin and here you see falafel, uh, a, a croquet, croquet, made from ful, that is uh, broad beans. And then you have basal akhdar, tum, ba'adunis mafrum, uh, 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 and then kamon, kisbara, simsim. So the, <laughs> you see the ingredients. And then this is the result today, and this is what I had in mind for it. The only difference is that in this case I did it with... Um, uh, 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 yes, I did it with, with indeed with full, with beans and not with chickpeas. So uh, they're a bit dark, but you see the, the, the insides turned out pretty well. And again, we use, <laughs> this is often my contribution to our neighborhood parties. Uh, Thomas, I just wanted to let you know that um, we've got about 10 minutes plus super, or minus super, to go. Super. Okay, now we, we are getting into a, an interesting detail. The frying pan. You see this ring, this is, a, this is an Indonesian style wok 
that needs to be stabilized by a ring because otherwise you can't do anything with it. But I put the ring inside because I had seen uh, that this Lebanese salesman, this vendor, actually used something similar. So that is how, again, I picked up an idea. But com coming back to this issue, I, wa I had wanted it to look like this and not like this, these simplified European fonts. And that, in the end, I only got this. So the, when I got to know Miriam, that was after my first uh, deployment in, in Lebanon, we, I started to discuss it with her. How can we do this? And, we, and she is a, an architect and a designer and an artist and together we created a variant of the Lego block where we improved the stub uh, system so that absence or presence of stubs actually forced you to use the right connection between uh, two uh, alternative forms for the same letter. So this word would only fit if you had the right contextual shapes. And the airplane that dropped by, that flew by, is actually our aircraft engineer, who was a, a hardcore industrial programmer, who turned this into <laughs> software and gave us the uh, possibility to make it much more abstract and go for the raw, the basic shapes, as I, I, <laughs> I had observed them in the rhythms of the pictures that I showed before this script grammar that I had used 10 years before as a student when I had to learn Arabic in support of Turkish. And I had also seen machines, typewriters that were uh, 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 electrical typewriters with type heads that could be modified or customized. And they also had a two-dimensional variant in, in a simple uh, ring. And we made a prototype where we sacrificed only four positions for necessary to create a meme <laughs> in its organic form. And this was the first ever typewriter that could, could produce this. And you can see on top, we sacrificed a few letters. Uh, we never proceeded to make the whole daisy wheel. We had on drawing uh, 70 uh, elements, but we instead, we, we were able with the help of the aircraft industry to scan them and turn them into outlines and bitmaps and were able to produce this mad word, the meme, 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 meme word, but once we had the whole set, only 70, we could do a, <coughs> a bismillah that actually looked the part, including all the strange kerning effects, which to this day nobody is able to do. And it was spotted by Microsoft in the, in the mid-90s, it became a standard part of every, every office Middle East uh, shipment, and it became also the inspiration for Microsoft and the proof of concept of how to deal with fonts in a digital environment. And to show you what we are talking about is here uh, uh, at the bottom a, a roca that follows the simple uh, linear approach and ours that builds it out of many components from a small set, many used uh, for different positions in the same word, so there is no connection between the shape and the function. And you see how, how dramatically different that becomes. A letter calf is also in the Roka script a real challenge. And also the letter B is a real challenge. I'm just highlighting a few ones. And the letter H is a real challenge. So here you have some examples. So that is how uh, uh, a deployment in the Middle East in the army with a background of curiosity and a broad education, knowledge of dead languages and a gradual acquisition of living language, a lot of traveling and sitting down with people and chatting helped me to get these ideas. And uh, eventually I contributed to the Unicode standard, which is the data interchange format that allows for more than just American English. The uh, first, the Sarit. <coughs> 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 Sorry, I pioneered <coughs> the Cyrillic character set because it also covered all the Turkic languages of the Soviet Union where I started and I worked <coughs> on Arabic and not just Arabic because why did I need to know Arabic? I was reading Ottoman Turkish in Arabic, not Arabic, with many more different characters and totally different structures. So eventually uh, in, in modern industrial concepts 
an Arabic data flash is just a series of boring numbers and the challenge is how can you get these numbers back into shape and uh, that is now acknowledged actually this is a recent academic study where there's one passage that points out that what we did was actually part of the desktop revolution we didn't re realize it <laughs> but everybody was suddenly able to use cheap computers to compete with the biggest and the most arrogant industries and to come with better solutions that they had bothered to look at and in this context they, we are described as uncompromising in the search for novel concepts and principles which ends up with being the most advanced typographical technology in the world and that is what you get if you're a bit deranged so that I think is the uh, um, the uh, 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 introduction that I wanted to give I have some some follow-up if in case there's time for it Thank you so much, Thomas, for this. And I'm gonna um, I'm gonna pass the mic over to William Anderson. And mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to thank everybody from the TypeCal team. But I'll hand it over to you, William. Thank you so much, Thomas. Again. Okay, thank okay. You. It was a pleasure to have this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas, for an amazing talk. And just remember, everyone that's uh, still online, uh, to be watching for the survey that will be coming out. Um, also uh, for the link to the recording and as well as keep your eyes open for our next talk on August 31st with Mohammed uh, Jabber. So again, I, I just want to uh, thank the whole TypeCal team um, and Thomas for an amazing talk tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.